are we really doing? And can we assess the long-term needs and progress on climate change adaptation here in New York? And this would be a very difficult challenge for anybody, but I think I have the right panel to begin this discussion. So what we've decided to do is I'm going to be asking questions to each member of the panel, and in the course of those questions, I will identify for you uh, some expertise that each member of the panel has, and you can see longer bios in your program. So I'd like to begin with John Boulay. Hi, John, and we haven't really uh, met before, and I probably should call you Colonel. Um, I should call you John, okay. Um, you are the vice chair of the MWA and someone with over 28 years of experience with the US Army, specifically commander of the New York District of the US Army Corps of Engineers, and you bring important experience to our discussion. I know everybody in this room values and understands the role of the Army Corps of Engineers. So I have the easy contextual question for you. Can you tell us what are the greatest threats related to climate change facing New York today? Not that everybody in this room doesn't know this, but I think hearing from the expert will, will set the stage for our conversation. And just as important, is the city focusing its policy and uses, using its resources effectively to address these threats to our water resources and our coastal areas? Well, thank you, Esther, and uh, thanks to uh, the Water uh, Front Alliance for putting on this. Uh, can't hear me? How about now? Beautiful. I'm just checking to see if you really cared about anything I had to say. Uh, apparently, one or two of you do, so that's good to, good to know. Well, thanks, Esther, for that introduction, and, and thanks to uh, MWA, soon to be WA. Uh, for putting on this great waterfront conference. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, you're a skeptic of uh, projections, Esther. You must have worked on some public uh, civil works projects in your time. Uh, don't worry, it'll only cost $2 billion, I promise. Um, <laughs> well, look, uh, you know, the, the threats uh, uh, due to uh, climate change and really the threats th to our resiliency uh, uh, are many, uh, but let's not forget, I, I, I sort of uh, put them into two categories. Let's not forget our security threats before we get into climate change. Uh, you know, we, we do have, we have had something called 9-11 and uh, we've got this, uh, this, this band called ISIS running around now. And uh, so we got to think about uh, uh, the security threats that we have here in, the, in this great metropolis that we live in. But I know the focus of this conference is on the environmental threats. And um, so you've got those two sets you've got to work with. And on the environmental side, much talked about sea level rise, what's it going to be? Uh, now uh, New York has uh, projections uh, out to 2100, which is useful. Uh, useful for planning, for sure. Uh, more frequent and violent storms, you know, Sandy, depending on where you are, 100 year, 500 year storm, you know, it might be a 50, to a 150-year storm maybe in, uh, in 30 or 40 years. That's a little scary. Uh, more frequent and violent storms. And then, of course, uh, you know, the, the city's chosen to uh, look uh, comprehensively at things like heat waves. Uh, let's not forget, uh, you know, if you're living on the 80th floor and uh, the power goes out in July, it's going to get hot real fast. Uh, so you got to look at... Uh, you got to look at heat waves too, I think, uh, and, and environmental threats like that as you're looking at uh, putting your plan together. So to the second part of your question, uh, effectiveness. You know, the effectiveness is what? How well do you accomplish your mission, right? Uh, do you achieve the goals? Uh, and uh, so what do you need to achieve your goals? Well, you need a plan. Uh, and then you need a sound plan. You know, that plan has to be well written and comprehensive. And then uh, you need to execute that plan and implement that plan. So the city has a plan. It had a plan seven months after Sandy. Uh, and uh, we've so much talked about plan, and we're not going to talk about it anymore to, other than to say that uh, 
You know, is it sound? Um, well, does it give you a layered defense? I'm a military guy. I like a defense in depth. Uh, well, it does. Uh, you've got different layers of, uh, of defense. Uh, you've got the coastal layer. You've got the uh, building layer. You've got the infrastructure layer. Uh, the more you think of resilience in, in terms of layers, uh, uh, the more you reduce your risk and reduce your vulnerability. Is it blended? Uh, One New York you mentioned, Esther, wonderful uh, vision, which includes um, sustainability goals, resiliency goals, growth goals, social objectives. Well, I, I think you nest within your resiliency solution all of that. It has to be a Venn diagram and you shoot right in the middle in that common space when you come up with solutions. And the city's trying to do that. Uh, and is it comprehensive? Yes. I mean, does it look at the most at-risk neighborhoods? Yes. Does it look at all different types of systems, infrastructure, transportation, telecom, fuel supply, uh, electrical supply? Yes, it does. So it's comprehensive. So I, I think it's a sound plan. Uh, it asks uh, uh, for a sort of a distributed solution on the coastline, uh, solutions uh, that are uh, within the character of the neighborhoods that they're going to be uh, uh, fabricated in and built in. Uh, so let's talk about the really hard part, which is implementation. And this gets to uh, how we're doing. I think the grade right now is incomplete. I think a fast start, and now we get to the real hard work. And that's the implementation. You know, another military thing. When, you, when you're fighting a defense, you, you want to either uh, uh, defeat or destroy slash annihilate the enemy. Okay? Uh, the city's plan is a defeat strategy. It is not an annihilate or destroy strategy. So going after those threats I talked about. What I mean by that is when you fight a defense, you are going to take some casualties. And I will tell you right now, even after the plan is implemented, there will be significant casualties. And what I mean by casualties is property damage is what I'm really after, okay? Um, so let, let's talk about, um, uh, you know, people need to understand that. And so uh, the city remains extremely vulnerable today. Uh, and it will remain extremely vulnerable for years to come. Are things being done? Absolutely. Read One New York. You can see what's been done on all the 250 plus resiliency objectives to this day. Very comprehensive, great reading. And uh, they lay it out there. Love it, very transparent. But has a lot been done on the coastline uh, to reduce the, the risk? I would say much more to do. Um, is that a surprise? It shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. This is a campaign plan. It's going to last for a generation. So I would just ask the city as, as I close here, because I know I, you wanted to keep it to about seven minutes, is let's focus on communication. Let's focus on risk communication. Uh, let's make sure our public knows that there will be damage as a result of threats due to climate change even after we implement the plan that's in place. And let's define uh, what expectations are going to occur in our neighborhoods after we get done. And then let's communicate that in creative ways so we have an informed public that's prepared and braced and uh, uh, aware of the risks that lie ahead. So I'll end with that. Thanks very much. Thank you. I think that was uh, an extremely helpful way to focus us and we'll continue the conversation with Adam Freed. Now Adam, You've had extensive experience both planning for the impacts of climate change and implementing, implementing as the Colonel points out to us, which is very important, city policy during the Bloomberg administration. So from your vantage point, has the city made any progress since the first plan, Plan NYC was announced in 2007? I think that uh, the Colonel says yes, but we wanna hear from you. And does the current de Blasio plan focus the city's financial resources and operational ca capacity on the most critical climate-related threats to our city? Um, certainly, that's an open question. Thank you. Um, so I, I will acknowledge that I'm very biased on whether or not Plan YC has had an impact on the city. Um, but I, I think it, it is uh, going to the data and looking objectively, uh, absolutely. There, there's been a lot of success from Plan YC since it was introduced in 2007. Uh, one, I think the, the hallmarks of it and uh, things that is so good about it, 
is that we knew at the time it was issued that we didn't have the right answers. In fact, probably weren't even asking all of the right questions, which is why there was the, by law, every mayor has to update the plan once every four years and has to issue progress reports so that there is moments to continually reevaluate and ask the question, how well are we doing? What has been the impact? Um, so looking at the data since 2007, the city's had a 19% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and now has the cleanest air quality it's had in over 50 years. We're now going through New York Harbor, it's the cleanest water quality in over 100 years. Um, you're looking at a, a 8% increase in New Yorkers who live within a 10 minute walk of a park. You've seen a $2 billion plus dollar program launching on green infrastructure, which has air quality benefits, recreational benefits, property value benefits, helps the city manage its stormwater issues as well and resilience from surface flooding. Uh, the third water tunnel is now nearing completion and about to be open, which is one of the great unsung risks in New York, what happens if we lose our water supply from an infrastructure failure standpoint or from a drought. Um, you're looking at the most aggressive energy efficiency legislation in the US, uh, over 4 million square feet of rooftops that have been coated white that help reduce the urban heat island effect and also reduce energy costs. Um, you're looking at the number seven extension, which is really revitalizing uh, the west side of Manhattan. Um, and then a really interesting rethinking of what public space is uh, and the city's relationship to the waterfront. I saw Michael Morella here earlier, who I know uh, helped lead the effort to create the waterfront plan for New York. And I think thinking about it as a resource, as an asset that relates to resilience and the overall sustainability of the city, um, I think Plan YC has had a tremendous impact and benefit for the city. Um, so a lot of progress that has been made uh, and continues to be made, the SIR, which is best in class when it comes to resilience planning uh, and the evolution of that. I think, you know, I agree with the Colonel that the, the question of what's the long-term impact and, and where we go from here is, still remains an open question. Uh, dealing with resilience is a very, very hard thing to do. Uh, and, and a couple of the uh, things that I think New York is well suited to uh, and is really best in class uh, under the previous administration and the current one, very data-driven, risk-based approach to planning. And I, I think looking at the heat vulnerability index is a great example of that. You can't address every risk all the time. How do you really focus your resources, focus your attention on those areas that address the greatest risks and have the biggest impact on people or on economic growth or on your resilience? Um, heat waves are, are the biggest killer when it comes to natural hazards. Uh, over 100 people die a year annually in New York from summer heat, exacerbating existing conditions. Um, so finding ways to address that, I think, is a great example of how Plan YC and One NYC now are looking at taking that data-driven approach. Um, looking at bold actions, both on the policy and the capital planning front, it's not going to be just the infrastructure that get built on the waterfront, but the building code changes that slowly change the DNA of the city to make us more resilient to the long-term and sudden shocks that we face. Um, looking at the innovative use of traditional and hard infrastructure and green infrastructure, as well as something that I think New York is really continuing to embrace and do a very good job at. Um, and demonstrating the ability to cut across sectors and silos, and, and it cannot just be a single agency that addresses these issues. We saw that with Plan YC. Many of the, the large uh, initiatives in the city had to be done by multiple agencies, but the city cannot do it alone. And I think the tremendous work that has happened cannot allow others to abdicate their responsibility. State and federal agencies to provide funding, to provide regulatory relief, and the private sector. We had a climate change adaptation task force included 40 different entities that controlled critical infrastructure in the city, 12 were city agencies, 15 were private sector companies, because so much of what's in the city uh, is controlled by others. So I think the city's done a good job and, and hope to see it continue to work with others across that. And why that's so important is because this is incredibly hard, difficult things. Uh, Dan will, will tell you that he doesn't have the luxury of only focusing on one issue at a time. We're going to do sea level rise and coastal storms this year. Next year, we'll worry about heat waves. We'll think about stormwater management another year. It really is how do you deal with all these issues at once and try to find those solutions that address them. Um, another challenge with resilience is there is no real way of quantifying the benefit. At its best, you are making a bad thing less likely to occur or not as impactful when it does occur. And how do you quantify avoided loss is a real challenge. Um, and I think something that finding those metrics to be able to measure your impact, to be able to 
hone in on those very specific biggest risks uh, is a challenge that remains not just for New York, but I think for everyone grappling with the issues of resilience. Um, and then I, I would just add that the, the final point that the Colonel made, communication is a key. And how do you sustain and maintain the momentum that's been had? People by our nature forget very quickly. Sandy is going to fade into people's minds as a critical event in the city, maybe not in the next year, next five years, next 10 years, but how do you maintain that momentum? How do you get past the fact that the one in 100 year flood doesn't mean it happened last year, we have another 99 years until it occurs again. It means there is a one in three chance it'll happen in 30 years. Um, so trying to get people to grapple with the idea of risk in a very different way than I think we're wired to do is, is one of the challenges that remains. Thank you very much, Adam. And I think it's really important to focus on metrics and measuring. Um, I think we learned that in the previous administration and the current administration continues to try and help us understand how to measure risk and how to understand success as well as failure. Um, you made the point that the private sector has a role here and for those of you who are still paying attention and not looking out the windows at this fabulous view on this fabulous day, um, you'll notice our panel, the panel is uh, very diverse by sector. And so our next speaker, Richard Anderson, um, many of you know Richard, I want to address a particular question to you, I think, that only uh, I think you and your organization can help us understand. Now, Richard is president of the New York Building Congress, <coughs> which is a public policy organization that represents the views of the design, construction, and real estate communities in New York City. And uh, Richard has been a member of the Mayor Bloomberg Sustainability Advisory Board and continues to be a member of Mayor de Blasio's uh, Sustainability Advisory Board. So his organization and he has been a constant presence on this issue. Um, you bring a very important perspective to the conversation. You bring the perspective of your industry. And so I want to ask you, what should the city be doing now to prevent climate-related threats to the city, but especially uh, our built environment. What should the private sector be investing in and where should we be spending our public dollars? So while I'm asking you about where the private sector should be investing, I also would like you to focus on this issue of where the public dollar should go also. Well, let's start out by saying the, uh, let's be candid with ourselves. Uh, we're doing better, but we're not doing uh, well enough. And uh, the, uh, the, it is, uh, as uh, Adam was just saying, the, uh, it's all about risk. And uh, one of the things that Superstorm Sandy uh, taught us uh, was that with its assault on our environment uh, is that we had four glaring needs in the city of New York. Uh, we needed stronger and more redundant power and telecommunications grids, probably first and foremost. Uh, secondly, uh, we needed uh, expanded and more resilient infrastructure. Uh, third, building uh, better uh, building performance and design standards and improved emergency planning oversight and protocols. And we set up a task force of our members. We've got nearly 2,000 members uh, in the design, construction, and real estate community. And they, uh, several dozen of them uh, came together under uh, former Lieutenant Governor Dick Ravitch to take a look. Uh, at uh, all of these issues, these glaring needs. And we, it, when you reduce uh, what they found and what they recommended, we came up with three things. The first, the first was hardened utility grids, because without the power, the subway system didn't run. When the subway system didn't run, without power, without communications, the economy collapsed. So the first and foremost thing was, we have to strengthen our utilities. The second, uh, we have to strengthen emergency response and planning. Uh, and this was something that I think the city has uh, turned to. Do I lose it? Yeah. yeah. The, the, city, the, the city has turned to uh, very well, but it's, it's a work in progress. And you'll hear this again and again. This is not something where there's a defined uh, objective. Once you reach it, you can declare victory. This is an ongoing process. And the third was to improve building codes and standards. And again, uh, we're finding that this is uh, being addressed by every governmental uh, agency 
uh, in, in, uh, in a very comprehensive way, but it's also a work in progress. So this uh, impressed us uh, how, just how important uh, the, um, or how vulnerable the city was uh, to, to, uh, to risk associated with, uh, with these issues. And we came back again and again uh, to, uh, to, to, to these uh, conclusions. Now, what can the city do and what can the private sector do uh, is um, spend money. We can't eliminate risks, but we can invest in the right things. And the first thing is to assure uh, that Con Edison uh, and National Grid and the, and the other utilities, the telecommunications utilities, that they invest. We're reassured because they are investing. Uh, Con Edison is investing up to two billion dollars a year in its system, and uh, we really rely on that. But we have to make sure that they get support. The Public Service Commission doesn't always approve their rate increases, uh, to uh, which gets translated into um, uh, get translated into uh, capital investment. So this is very important. It's very important for telecommunications uh, that we upgrade. Uh, our uh, our uh, communications uh, systems. Uh, when you look at the city's uh, capital budget, it's a $10 billion capital budget. It probably should be uh, several billion more a year. And much of that has to be directed to resiliency. Uh, it's not just to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, maintain a state of uh, good repair for what was there before. And of course, half of the infrastructure in the city of New York is not under the direct responsibility of the city. The other, it's, it's state agencies like the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and it's having a very difficult time getting its capital program supported. People don't want to uh, spend money on, uh, on infrastructure and yet we have to spend it to develop a more resilient uh, and a redundant uh, system. And then the final example I'll give, uh, I just attended a conference this morning on Trans-Hudson transportation issues. We desperately need new rail tunnels under the Hudson River. And we have two 100-year-old tunnels that were severely damaged by, by uh, Superstorm Sandy. They need to be repaired and actually closed down and repaired for a sustained period of time, uh, like the Montague Street uh, tunnels on the, uh, uh, on the, on the R train. And, uh, but that, the money for that to do, to build a new gateway project, uh, is in the order of $15 billion. And we have to find the way. It's got to be a shared responsibility of the federal government, the city government, the state government, and the private sector. So this is a, a long-term effort, uh, and uh, I think we're making good progress, but we're far from there. Thank you, Richard. Um, this was, uh, I think, a very important perspective that you bring to the panel and remind us that uh, there's a role here, particularly for the utilities, to invest, but that also the city doesn't have all the legal authority to make these kinds of investments in infrastructure that we all know we need to do. And that becomes a political challenge. And hopefully we'll get to that uh, after we give every member of the panel an opportunity to speak. So that leads me to Matt Ryan. Now, Matt, you are the executive director of Align, the Alliance for Greater New York, and you've had many successful labor community coalitions, including Climate Works for All and the Alliance for a Just Rebuilding. From the perspective of labor, I'm asking everybody to sort of represent a different constituency here, so forgive me for that. What are the greatest climate-related threats to working New Yorkers in the neighborhoods which you might think are most vulnerable? And does the current de Blasio plan focus the city's financial resources and operational capacity on the most critical climate-related threats to our city from your perspective? Uh, well, first off, I just want to thank the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance for the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, it's great to be with everyone. Um, I was at a conference recently in California that brought together many different organizations and community organizers who are working on climate resiliency right now. And first off, I just want to say that uh, I was struck by uh, what a good place we're starting from right now here in New York. I mean, I'm very clear on the challenges we have. but. Uh, we can't lose sight of the fact that uh, even before Sandy, we had Plan NYC, and that was an incredibly important starting point to be getting our heads around a, a vision for environmental sustainability, uh, infrastructure, and some of the issues that were raised here today. Uh, and secondly, uh, 
you know, in a moment of crisis after Hurricane Sandy hit us, it spurred us to create SIRR and uh, world-class uh, plans right now to deal with resiliency, particularly uh, with when it comes to infrastructure and much of what we've heard here today. So first off, I want to say we're in a good place where we're starting from, although we have an immense amount of work to do in front of us. And speaking specifically about threats to low income and working people here in the city, I want to lift up a, a few different things. So our organization has been working to knit together an alliance of grassroots community organizations, labor unions, worker centers, and other organizations that represent often the most vulnerable New Yorkers out there. And some of the things that we've been seeing are, uh, one, that we have to continue to remember that this issue is going to impact more and more people over the coming years. And we've had a lot of focus in the media on Far Rockaway, uh, Staten Island, and, and with very good reason. But we can expect in the coming years that the number of people that will be impacted is going to increase 84 percent. So we're looking at at least 400,000 people that will be in flood areas. This is going to impact many, many more low income and working people. Uh, I think the city is aware of this, uh, but it's not always in the, the, the media as much as it needs to be. Uh, number two, uh, we can't lose sight of the issue of heat and increased temperature. Uh, so it's been said a number of times here, which is great to hear. And just speaking from uh, uh, working people's perspective, we have to remember that if temperatures are going to be increasing by as many as five degrees by 2050, this is going to disproportionately impact people who work outside, construction workers, other uh, public sector workers here in the city. And this is something that we're not fully prepared to deal with right now and we have to continue to focus on because it will disproportionately impact working people. Um, one thing that we heard a lot in the rebuilding phase after Sandy was how many people were being displaced who were living uh, either legally or, or improperly in basement apartments uh, and first floor apartments. And this is something that we're dealing with right now where the combined impact of loss of housing stock for important resiliency efforts that we're taking on right now uh, to protect basements and no longer make them uh, areas for apartments is going to shrink our housing stock. Um, we, and this, of course, compounds into the affordable housing plan we hear, have here right now in New York City. So I think it's wonderful that we have an ambitious affordable housing plan in the city, but we can't lose sight of the fact that just as we're building and being ambitious with that, we're also losing housing stock through the very resiliency efforts that we have to be taking on. These two have to be taken in tandem. Uh, and then, you know, a final point that I'd like to make is just to make sure that we don't lose sight of social resiliency as a concept that has to be there. So we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about energy grids, all of which is of the utmost importance. I don't want to distract us from that at all. But remembering that the concept of social resiliency is something that's going to allow us to weather future storms. So a definition I might offer for social resiliency is our ability as a community or as groups of people to cope with external stresses and disturbances that are a result of social, political, or environmental change. So this is our ability to cope with these changes in our community, uh, the ability to adapt quickly, and the ability to transform both our institutions uh, and government to be able to adapt to these changes. So this is something I think cuts to the heart of the mayor's current talk about inequality in the city and how vulnerable it makes our communities when people are living paycheck to paycheck. And something that our organization has been advocating for is how we need to think about a plan for social resiliency that meets the opportunity to invest in good job creation, big public works project, and much of what's being talked about here. So if I have a second, I'll just end by saying I think there's a very exciting project that the uh, current mayor has taken on in the new Build It Back uh, program. Build It Back is an initiative that's focused on uh, elevating homes and making homes more resilient. And in this, there's a commitment to a local hiring initiative. And this is targeting people in Sandy impacted communities, low income people, who are now going to have an opportunity for not just access to a living wage job, but also the access to training that can hopefully lead to a long term career as well through coping with this disaster and needing to build back. And I think it's these kind of innovative initiatives that we can take on that are going to help improve our social resiliency, the stability of working people, and uh, match up with a, a very bold plan and a great plan we have in the form of SIRR, 1NYC, and, and other related initiatives. So I'll stop with that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and this is a very important perspective that Matt brings here, um, keeping us focused also on the people who are impacted uh, by climate change, working people, communities everywhere in the city. Um, this is not just a problem for Manhattan real estate. And I think the extent to which the coalition is broadened 
uh, as we see at this table, this becomes a problem which we can better focus on as a city. Now, important to whether or not anybody knows that anything is going on in the area of resiliency and sustainability, and whether or not any understand, anybody understands the risk, um, is the role of the media. And certainly community organizations have an important role in educating us and making sure, as the Colonel said, that people understand this problem. Um, but the media is critical. And so I have a question uh, for Mas Matthew Sherman. Matthew, as a senior editor of WNYC Radio, some people may think that's an elite radio station, but it really isn't. It's just a radio station that tries to get its facts right. Um, was that an editorial comment? Okay. I'll own it. I'll own that comment. WNYC is a radio station that actually tries to get its facts right and inform the public. So as senior editor, you've been responsible for some of the most important media coverage of Hurricane Sandy and the city's response. And we look to you and WNYC for some honest answers to some difficult questions. And as I said, you are, after all, resent, representing public radio here, a different standard than the rest of the media world. From your perspective, what were the most important lessons the city needed to learn from Hurricane Sandy? And have we made any real progress, implemented any important policies since 2012 that will protect the city from the threat of climate change? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, Glad to be here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. Um, I would say there are three big questions that come to mind. I'm talking really big picture here, so bear with me if this seems really elementary, because I think it's really helpful just to think in elementary terms. One is that unlikely events can happen, and that unlikely events will become more likely as time goes on. We're not even talking about sea level rise here. We're just talking if something has a one in 100 chance uh, of happening in any single year. Uh, I did the math before coming here. Uh, over 100 years, you have about a 63% chance of that happening. Uh, a, something that is even less likely, like Sandy, 0.15% chance of it happening uh, over uh, a period of years, uh, has about a 15% chance of happening in, in uh, 100 years. I'm sorry. I, Sandy is considered a 700-year event, I should say. S second point, cities last hundreds if not thousands of years, whether we like them or not. And third is that interdependency is really a pain in the neck. So uh, the first thing about the unlikely events that can happen, we excused ourselves from Sandy because we had never seen anything like this before. We could not imagine it. When you're talking about things that are really rare, like major hurricanes hitting a northeastern seaboard uh, port, uh, we don't have enough records, weather records, to really gauge what is likely or not likely. They only go back 150 years or so. So if we're talking about a 700-year storm, uh, we have no, no way of determining what that looks like, and our memories are just too short. So we can't rely on our memories to really predict these events. I don't know how the scientists do it, and given the, given the problems with, sci uh, with, with sea level rise and, and such, I think it's frankly a very hard task for anybody to predict just how bad the next disaster will be. Two, about the cities lasting longer than you want them to, what I mean there is that the biggest damages uh, that Sandy inflicted were really on our what are called our legacy systems, our subway system that was built 100 years ago, <clears throat> bungalows that were never intended to last, were never intended to, to be lived in year round, uh, that were never intended to last more than 30 years, uh, being built on areas right by the shore. Uh, and the, um, the big question there is, are we building in such a way where we might think that the design life of this structure is only 30 years, 50 years, 80 years, because that's what the architect decided to be the design life. But chances are 
because cities are dynamic places, some of these things at least will still be around 150 years from now, whether we like it or not. We just cannot keep replacing our, our subways and upgrading them to uh, the, the latest predictions of sea level rise uh, every, every five or 10 years. The interdependency question, what I mean by that is we have one agency in Washington, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, that, that, that draws our floodplains, our flood maps, and the city department of buildings has to implement them in some sort of way. When those maps fail, or when the storm is greater than we expect it to be, we then have to go, we have to rely on a national flood insurance program. Uh, right after Sandy, everybody was screaming about these people who didn't have flood insurance and how irresponsible they were. But in the last uh, nine months, we've learned that even people who have had flood insurance aren't getting the money that they need because the flood insurance system is broken. It's also broke. Uh, we relied on Congress to, to bail us out through this giant uh, $50 billion Sandy package, but it took a year and a half just to get the first money out of the door, and it'll probably take another uh, three years or so uh, to get it all out the door. So those are the three lessons, I would say. Have we learned them? I'm not sure. I, I'm, I, I'm fortunate to be sitting next to Dan Zirilli, and he'll correct me if I say anything that's wrong, speaking of getting things accurate. I would say this, I would say we have made calculations about whether, about the risk that we are willing to take or the risk that is reasonable to take. Uh, one example that I think is, is good to use is about this thing called freeboard, which basically means if FEMA says there's a 1% chance any year that the water will come up to here on me, I gotta put on another two, foot, two feet uh, on the foundation of my house. Uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> or, or one foot, or whatever f amount of space uh, there is. After Sandy, we put in that regulation requiring two feet of freeboard. Was that for sea level rise? The city portrays it as such. But FEMA was recommending uh, two foot freeboard even before Sandy hit. State of New York had that as a requirement. And if you look really far out in terms of um, the predictions that came out a couple of months ago from the New York City and panel, panel on Climate Change, they are predicting between one and six feet of freeboard. Uh, so in other words, that if we build a house now and if it's still around in the year 2100, there might be a flood that will, that will hit it, that will soak the first four feet of it. And we're not even talking about all those legacy homes. We're talking about the new homes that are built to the, to the highest standards we can imagine. There are reasons that the city decided to stop at two feet freeboard, two foot freeboard. It's a hard calculation to meet. After all, as I said, the scientists said there's a good chance of seeing one to six feet of, of sea level rise. That's a huge range. Uh, do you prepare for the one foot or the six foot? Uh, if you put six foot of freeboard in some of these areas on top of what FEMA is predicting to be, let's say, 13 feet of flooding or more, then we run into a problem that I think Matt Ryan is familiar with, which is we would have to be moving people, even more people, out of these, these low-lying uh, zones. And right now, the mayor is, in, is, is trying desperately to create uh, 200,000 units of affordable housing, half a million uh, new units of any sort of housing uh, to accommodate the growth in the city. Uh, it would also make building very expensive and such. So, <clears throat> in other words, resiliency really comes at, uh, presents some really difficult choices about where we want to put our money, where we want to put our people, how much we want to grow. And I'm trying not to take a, um, reach a diff definite conclusion on whether or not we really have learned what we, what we should have learned from this. But as I said, I think we've made a ser series of calculations. Uh, whether or not the public is comfortable with, the, with that amount of risk that we're taking on, I think that's up to the public. Thank you.
Thank you, Matthew. I think that's a, such an important point that you're bringing up about risk and the cost of risk, and also bringing up the federal flood insurance program, who should bear the cost of people continuing to live in high-risk places on the shorelines? So we'll leave those questions on the table for the later discussion. But I want to move us to our respondent and to Dan Zerilli. Uh, thank you for coming and being brave and representing the mayor's office. Um, I've done that. And it's, <laughs> fortunately for you, I think this is a, a very uh, supportive and warm crowd. So Dan, you have your own experience in this area, not just your current experience. You, you were the first director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and you were director of resiliency before that. You are an engineer, and like the colonel, who was also an engineer, you actually like to fix things that are broken. You know how to fix things that are broken. I'm always in awe of the engineers. And you are, in fact, responsible for leading the implementation of the Mayor's Resiliency Program, <clears throat> which focused on strengthening coastal protections, upgrading buildings, and improving infrastructure. So um, you are also the one who knows the most about the Mayor's new plan on this panel. And so what has the administration accomplished so far from your perspective, and are we on track to achieving the goals of resiliency and sustainability outlined in the mayor's One New York plan? There's a simple question for you. It's a softball. Thank you, Esther. So I, I wrote down a couple of notes from, uh, from the other, um, uh, my other panelists. And so resiliency is defined as it's hard to do. It's impossible to measure. There's not enough money not enough city control over our assets, and thanks, Matt, unlikely events are going to become even more likely. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here. I, don't, I certainly um, uh, am happy to talk through what the city's been doing. I think we've been doing a lot. I think we have a lot more to do. I don't think anybody disputes that. Hurricane Sandy certainly did highlight a lot of our vulnerabilities around uh, the risks of a changing climate. 44 lives were lost, $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity, and we know that's growing. Um, but we also know those aren't the only threats that we face. It's not just coastal storms and sea level rise. Uh, we face a broad array of climate risks. Uh, we've mentioned heat a few times here. I think it's important to continue to, to emphasize and highlight the, the focus on heat and the city's new focus and emphasis on uh, measuring our heat vulnerability index and putting in place programs to reduce that vulnerability. We're taking a broad look at other natural hazards, um, the, the changes that are coming to our economy, the changes that are coming uh, from growing inequality. There's a broad range of things that are happening. And we're at an interesting historic moment. And uh, this was, I think, well, well described in the, in the release of 1NYC just uh, a few weeks ago now. If you look at the, the city seal, it says 1625. So, um, uh, I guess when the, when the first New Amsterdam charter was established, in 10 years, we're going to be at the 400th anniversary of New York City. So it's a really, really interesting historical moment to think that in, in 10 years, in the next, over the course of the next decade, we're going to be preparing ourselves for the fifth century. And, and so we've taken stock as an administration, certainly looking back at all the great work that was done through Plan YC and, and figuring out how we needed to build upon that and even expand upon it, knowing that there are new threats. Our population continues to grow. There's going to be 9 million people by 2040 here in the city. Our infrastructure is aging. Um, I think Dick would be the first one to tell you that we need to be investing more in our infrastructure. There's uh, certainly changes coming in our climate. We know that sea level rise alone is going to be adding, by the end of the century, something in the order of two to four feet of, uh, of water in our harbor. High end projections are six feet. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly something to be very cognizant of. There are other climate risks as the risks of heat wave and increased temperature and precipitation and others are, are changing. And of course, growing inequality. And, and within this context, there's a growing recognition of, our, of the importance of the region. The city doesn't succeed unless the region succeeds, and the region doesn't, doesn't succeed unless the city does. And we need better ways to engage our, our residents and citizens in um, all that we do as a, as a city. So the, the one NYC plan, and of course I always bring a prop whenever I come to the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. The, the one NYC plan um, is uh, 
chock full of good information on the threats we face, but more importantly, what we're doing about it and how we're really approaching the challenges that we just, um, that we just discussed, um, focused on four main themes. Growth, so we are a growing city and we want to continue to grow, we want to grow in the right way. Um, equity and, and finding ways to make New York work for all New Yorkers. It's a fundamental fairness around how we function as a city. Um, and then spend a little more time on sustainability, of course, and resiliency. And, and these are not necessarily new, new themes um, in some ways. The, the growth, the sustainability, the resiliency, all of these were fundamental to the prior Plan YC um, efforts from 2007, 2011, and the SIR report in 2013. Um, with a new focus, of course, on equity and making sure that we're making all of these investments, all of these um, programs, initiatives work for the New Yorkers that are most vulnerable to the risks that are coming um, here in New York City. Um, and ultimately, this is, this is about not just climate change, it's about a, a broad range of 21st century threats. We've, we've been through a lot. I think uh, the Colonel rightly points out, you know, between 9-11 and the Ebola uh, panic of last year, there was uh, two hurricanes, an earthquake, a blackout, an economic downturn. There's a broad range of things that we do face. And so all of this, uh, while it can be scary in some ways, um, getting back to those initial uh, um, comments around how hard this is and impossible, there's, um, there's good news in here is that we have um, engaged with a broad range of stakeholders, lots of uh, city residents, all sorts of experts to think through how to best take those next steps over the next 10 years to prepare the city for that fifth century um, after 2025. Today's also a, an interesting moment in that in that we're, we just released um, our 10-year capital plan and the city's budget, and so um, even uh, more to come on how the initiatives and other, and other programs are being funded um, coming out today. But it boils down to a multi-layered strategy. Um, first and foremost, we need stronger communities. We need to strengthen uh, the places where we live, work, and play. We need to make sure that we have engaged, effective community-based organizations, houses of worship, and finding ways to engage them to address that social resiliency gap that we may have in the city um, and continue to make sure that uh, we are expanding and, and improving our emergency preparation, our um, communication of risk, a broad range of things that we're doing on the social side. And of course, much that continues to be done and remains to be done on the physical side. Upgrading our buildings, we've taken some steps to already upgrade our building codes, our zoning codes. There's more to be done. Uh, there's also an incredible challenge on existing buildings that we continue to face that we're um, continuing to pursue. Adapting our infrastructure, this is where it gets really regional and we can think about our transportation infrastructure, but it's also in our liquid fuels networks, our hospitals. Um, every, all of it is interdependent, it's, uh, it's linked. When one thing fails, others go down and so working to make sure that our infrastructure is adapted to these risks in the future. And of course, continuing to improve our coastal defenses. And uh, the city's already launched its $3.7 billion capital program. We continue to source funds to fill that. It's nearly half funded at this point, and we're continuing to do that. And in fact, we're, we're passing some of the locations of those projects down when we were on the Lower East Side. Uh, we have a project from the HUD funded from Rebuild by Design that's continuing to move forward. Overall, there's about $20 billion right now being spent um, according to the city's plan from a number of sources, city, state, federal, and when you wrap in the whole region, it's actually probably about $30 billion that's being spent on recovery from Hurricane Sandy as well as long-term resiliency efforts. It's not a trivial amount of money, and we are continuing to uh, pursue turning on and, and continuing that capital program to make sure we're making those investments in as timely a way as possible. Um, but ultimately, you can measure our progress. How are we doing? It's sort of the, uh, the Ed Koch question of how am I doing? How are we doing? Um, <laughs> We are required, of course, and we don't just do it because we're required. We, we believe in transparency. We put out our, um, our annual progress report every year. We did that last year. I think that was my prop last year that I held up and, and showed off uh, the, the annual progress report from 2014. The back of the one NYC plan here includes this year's progress report on the prior uh, sustainability and resiliency initiatives. So you can read in all excruciating detail about every single one of those projects and what's happening and what's coming next. Um, ultimately, it's progress. We're moving forward. Um, no one's going to argue that there's a lot more to be done. This is definitely a generational um, affair that we've kicked off. But the important news is that we continue to act and we continue to, to uh, source the money we need. We continue to build the partnerships we need and we continue to make, uh, to make our city safer against the, the impacts of climate change as well as other 21st century threats. So with that, happy to comment that the city is committed to this effort. We're going to continue to lead on this and we would love all your help. Um, Thanks for your time.
Uh, thank you, Dan. I'm um, that sort of leads us to our last round of uh, short response questions before we open it up for uh, questions from all of you. Um, by bringing in your prop, and I'm trying to get a hard copy of that plan because it's, I'm one of those people who don't like to read it online, so I'm working on that. I don't know how everybody else feels about that. Um, you made it clear that the mayor has outlined a broad and comprehensive vision for the future of New York in this uh, One New York plan. And so I'm going to ask everybody on the panel to comment on a sort of difficult question about implementation as it relates to the planning process. Um, a sustainable and resilient city uh, are meant to be understood as part of a larger plan in the de Blasio plan that includes economic growth and a just and equitable city, um, as Dan points out. There's a, there's a real discussion, if not a set of disagreements, about how one writes a plan best for the purposes of making sure it ultimately actually gets implemented. So um, I want to ask all the panelists to comment on this. Uh, plan NYC was a very comprehensive, but um, a plan which focused prim primarily on sustainability and resiliency and didn't have the broader contextualization um, that one, one New York has. So will this all-inclusive plan make it easier or more difficult to fund and accomplish the long-term goals of building a resilient and climate change ready city? And you know that's a difficult question, so I figure everybody can answer it in any way that they're comfortable uh, with answering it. Uh, for those of you who don't want to be critical of the administration, we all understand that. Um, but please try and be honest in the way you approach this, because I think this is actually very important to understand uh, now when we move forward on the agenda of this conference. So I'm going to start with the Colonel. Short answer. Uh, <laughs> the more wide-ranging a plan is, and the more inclusive it is, the more difficult it is uh, to get done. Um, I think uh, Dan, you know, what I focused on what he said is continue to act. Uh, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's very difficult to run a marathon in uh, in today's world where we want things now and we want them fast. So, real challenging. Adam. Yeah, I, you know, focusing more broadly on, on any plan that has ambition and, and breadth, you know, planning is often very easy. The implementation is, is incredibly hard. Um, you know, I've had the chance to work with Dan and a lot of the staff that's there. I have the utmost confidence in the ability to implement, and I, I think that's the challenge just to be as, as concrete as possible on the actions that are being taken, the funding sources. Uh, the milestones that are going to be met towards long-term goals and quantifying what those goals are, and then having the transparency to not only allow the government to keep themselves on track, but others as well, and MWA has always played a very strong role uh, in doing that uh, with the city as well. So I, I think it is, uh, the bigger the ambition, the, the harder the task is, and I think that uh, it, it's very hard to implement, um, but we don't have an option, and, and I'm you know, encouraged to see the progress that's been made so far. Richard? I take a contrary view. Uh, I think uh, building a great city is a shared responsibility. There are a lot of players, and these players are going to uh, uh, invest and take actions and, and uh, do their part regardless of whether they have guidance or not. And I think about all those uh, city, state, federal, private sector organizations that are building this city. And if you have a comprehensive vision, you're better able uh, to lead uh, the city because you're telling Con Edison this is what you want Con Edison to do. You're telling the private sector this is what you want them to do at Hudson Yards or at World Trade Center and other different places, uh, East Midtown. So I, my view is uh, a comprehensive, ambitious plan is not as difficult because these, the, uh, your, the, the other participants in building the city are looking for guidance and if, even if they're not looking for it, you're giving it to them anyway. Matt. So I, I think I'm going to make a, a similar point. And um, I think we have uh, one thing that's very exciting right now is none of us are talking about 
a plan to survive. We're really talking about a plan to make ourselves an even better city than we were before we started to deal with this. So that's exciting and it's an exclusive, inclusive vision that can bring a lot of people together. And I think the coalition builder in me thinks this is actually what we need to have a, a broad enough coalition, the breadth uh, required to make funding happen, to deal with other levels of government beyond the city and do the very difficult things that uh, are gonna be required of us. So um, I would say you know, the, the, the breadth is really in the opportunity to organize a much broader coalition and get this done, uh, but I have no illusions about how hard that is. Matthew? Uh, I would, you know, I look at this volume as uh, the Dan has here as uh, a, a communications tool. Uh, and there's one advantage of putting everything that your administration cares about in uh, whatever it might be, 250 pages or so, uh, which is that it makes people like me in the journalism community and elsewhere um, have one place to go uh, to look at whatever it is you're dealing with. And there's, there are huge advantages uh, from the communication side. The other point I would like to make is, you know, if we're talking, let's say, about moving the people from Midland Beach, Staten Island, out of there, which no one's now talking about, but if we were, we'd have to find a place for them. We'd have to find other affordable housing. In other words, resiliency and his housing plan have a huge amount to do with, with each other. Uh, I think that a lot of the stuff in Bloomberg's plan was really hidden. These connections. We don't want to. We don't want to get too tough on the on the on the on the housing stuff because we have to deal with where to put these people elsewhere. And I think that uh, that's a real advantage with the one NYC plan is that we begin to see some connections between affordable housing, resiliency, resource management. Um, and if anything, I'm actually surprised De Blasio didn't create more emphasize the links between these sectors even more than he did. Uh, Dan, you get the last word the last until word. we have questions. So, I mean, on the point that implementation is, is difficult, absolutely, but it's necessary. Um, and I think that by laying out the vision, what we do is we um, demonstrate what's important to us. We show what the next steps are and how we're going to achieve it. We put out our goals and our indicators. And ultimately, we put our money on the table for where we want this to go. And that's, I think, um, how we bring in all those other players, whether it's the private sector, whether it's the other regional players. Um, the city has a, a necessary leadership role, and we're taking it, and I think we need to continue to lay that out. Um, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, we're going to be continuing to have this discussion because this, this is something that does not turn off after this conference. It doesn't turn off after this year or after this term. Um, we're going to continue doing it, and uh, please don't wait till next year if you have feedback. We're, uh, you know, we are I'm very interested in continuing to hear how we're doing and what can be improved. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, do we need a long-range, multi-decade, multi-generational plan to reduce flood risk through 2100? Anybody want to hit that? I think that's what we have. <laughs> okay. Well, that was okay, easy. Well, hold on. I got some. Maybe may we have some contrary opinions on the panel. Well, I, um, think, I think just just because uh, I don't know if I want to let that go too far. Is is that right, Dan? Here, if I could just be interlocutor. I thought it was 20, 2050 was the official uh, sort of benchmark for resiliency planning. Here, I'll, uh, I'll arbitrate. You're both right. Um, we've we've laid out. Um, basically, what we know the risks to be, and with the New York City Panel on Climate Change most recent report, we've taken our sea level rise projections, our flooding projections out to 2100. Um, I don't think it's right to say we know what project we're going to be doing in 2080, for instance. And you got to remember, there's uncertainty built into these projections, so it might be better than we expected. It might be worse than we expected. We're taking action on the projects we need to now to reduce our risk in the way that makes sense, and we're making the right investments. And then fundamental to the concept of adaptive pathways and investments, we're going to need to continue doing this over time. And this is not something that stops. It's not something where you lay out a 100-year plan necessarily. But what we've laid out is a, is a long-term pathway so that we're continuing this conversation uh, even beyond the, the specific projects we're talking about now. There's always that political problem of not being in office 
100 years from now, so it's easy to <laughs> backload that plan with all the hard stuff for when you leave. So yes, you know, we need those long-term plans, but it's certainly understandable why the public often gets frustrated and often, you know, doesn't believe these plans when all the accomplishments are loaded toward the far end, uh, far away times when probably most of us won't even be around anymore. But that's a complicated conversation, isn't it? So I'm going to go to an easy question for the Colonel. Are we prepared for cyber attacks on our systems that provide our necessities, i.e. Con Ed and the subways? How do you like that easy question? Well, none of you are cleared for the answer to that question. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you it's an amazing what, uh, what uh, kind of warfare is going on second by second out there in cyberspace. And uh, it is quite a, uh, a, a war. And, uh, you know, whether we win or lose is absolutely essential to, quite frankly, the existence of our way of life. Uh, so this is an area that we need to... Uh, continue to invest in and continue to, to uh, maintain the technological lead. Well, I have an interesting question here with uh, several a acronyms um, that I'm not sure what they are. So this question goes to the person who knows what these acronyms are. How specifically will the ESCR project integrate resiliency to the social construct of the LSE public housing? This sounds like a dissertation defense. Okay. Um, Let me translate. So who's ready to translate and help us out and, and help answer this question? I'm sure it's an important question. So ESCR is our incredibly sexy name for the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, which is the, the result uh, the first compartment of what was funded out of the Rebuild by Design competition on the Lower East Side, LES. I think, uh, I think that's the, both acronyms that I need to get to. Um, ultimately, there's two, two really, really important concepts that we're trying to achieve with that project. One is reducing risk, reducing flood risk for sure. Um, the second uh, really important goal of the project is to make sure that we're continuing to enhance our access to the waterfront. It, it would be, you know, it, it wouldn't be, these wouldn't be good projects if we build flood walls all over the city and cut ourselves off from the waterfront. But we do need to find ways to reduce risk. And so what's really innovative about this project is how it's uh, really pulling together uh, flood protection that is part of the park in East, uh, East River Park, that's part of the neighborhood that integrates into the neighborhood and actually provides better access uh, to the park uh, at the end of the day, and so it serves dual purpose. That's what we're trying to accomplish. We're in the in the process right now of a, 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 a pretty much a 12-month conversation with the community on how this is going to look um, as we're doing all of our pre-environmental review work um, before the end of this year. And so we're working th these sort of questions out with the community right now. What's your timeline once you finish community engagement, which is clearly important? And you know, my compliments to you for making that process happen. What's the timeline for the implementation on this? So we've laid out a pretty aggressive uh, goal of getting into construction by 2017. Um, so by staying on track with the community engagement process through the end of this year, we'll be able to get into design and environmental review to, uh, to make that happen. OK, a question for Matthew. Does the public understand, this is a really wonderful question. Does the public understand the degree of sea level rise risk we are facing? No. No. <laughs> uh, I don't know how much more to elaborate. A little bit more. <laughs> um, I think there are two types of people out there, probably people who don't understand sea level rise and what that will mean. People who don't understand that if they uh, even, let's say, aren't in a flood plain, they are still at risk for flooding. The 400,000 people that are supposed to be in the floodplain in the year, uh, was it 2050, or by, uh, that Matt Ryan mentioned? Well, that's only a certain, it could be much more than that because it could be a much worse flood. There are those people, and then there are other people actually who really freak out when you talk about sea level rise and they think we're all going to drown. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, this is important. Matt, could you tell us what, you know, community organizations and the alliances that you're involved with 
are doing to help educate the public about some of these really complicated issues, but things that we need them to understand and we need them to be involved in, because clearly that was the intent of this question. We need the public to understand these things. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're taking every opportunity we can find to educate community uh, around the urgency of the threat, but also the opportunity uh, to act and make our city even better. So uh, just to give a couple specific examples, in the lead up to last year's UN Climate Summit and the People's Climate March, um, some of our brothers and sisters at SCIU 32BJ, the Building Service Workers Union here in the city, uh, did extensive trainings with their membership. And I know one of the things they did that really seemed to click with members was they had a string that I believe was um, about five feet long. And uh, I don't particularly have the math perfect here, maybe Dan can correct me, but they had a string that represented how much we expect sea levels to rise in the next uh, few decades. And it was really something that simple that finally clicked with the members thinking, I can understand that, that's right in front of me. And for building service workers, you think, oh wow, I have to deal with this office building every night and that's going to impact my office building uh, and may even impact where I live as well. Uh, so, you know, that's one example in our organization right now is actually doing a series of conversations around long-term resiliency plans that integrate these concepts of uh, economic equality efforts and social resiliency in and around the city. Although I'll say one thing that we're really trying to focus on are areas that are not shoreline communities because I think Shoreline communities rightly are getting a lot of attention right now, but we also need to be thinking about other precarious areas more uh, into the outer boroughs um, that will be dealing with heat waves and other sorts of threats as well. Um, I want to uh, pose this question to uh, Richard. Actually, the questioner wanted to ask you this. Would you please comment on the failed plan to improve the Hudson River tunnels? Easy questions from this crowd, huh? <laughs> well, the last time we built a Hudson River tunnel uh, was in 1910. And these are their two twin tunnels, and that's what the Northeast Corridor uh, Rail Service is coming into Penn Station. And that includes the tunnels that go, uh, that serve the Long Island Railroad as well. That was all done in the first part of the last century. Uh, nothing except maintenance of those tunnels has been done in those corridors since then. And of course, in Hurricane Sandy, they got damaged severely to the point where uh, they have to be closed down at some point in the future and, and rebuilt. The saltwater intrusion uh, has been stabilized, but it's not even been stabilized. It's still working against them. So we need uh, a redundancy uh, in, in, uh, in those tunnels. And there's no substitute for building two twin tunnels uh, alongside the ones in the, in the Hudson River. Amtrak has got a good proposal called Gateway uh, it will cost 15 to 20 billion dollars. It's being detailed right now. And it's something that can't be done just with one level of government. Every single player, including the private sector, needs to contribute. Federal government has to step up big time, but both states, the city, the private sector, the Port Authority, and this is uh, one of those uh, projects uh, that we just can't put off. Uh, that's very important, and it's a good segue into uh, this question for Adam. Uh, how do we engage the private sector more to assist in the city's efforts to be more resilient? Are there any pilot studies being considered either in New York City or in other cities that we might learn from about public-private partnerships with investors um, and creating a payment system, for example, to build uh, flood control structures? You know, I, I think the public-private partnership idea is, is a critical one because, as everyone said, there's not enough money from all sources together, certainly not from one source, to deal with the risk that we have, particularly with the, the complicated infrastructure that's often needed. There have been some interesting models in London. Uh, there was a paper performance contract that was done around flood reduction that engaged private sector investors to say, we don't care how you mitigate risk, but you need to mitigate it up to a certain degree, um, and that's how you'll be paid and, and uh, going forward on that. I think some of the models that are looking at, uh, you know, how do you monetize avoided loss, uh, particularly when it comes to insurance, and, and how do you take some of the benefits? There was a great graphic, I think it was in the SIR report, that showed, you know, how much with the sea level rise, um, how much your flood insurance could increase 
given certain circumstances. I think it was about $900 a year that you could face from houses. And if you were able to monetize that across the board by saying if you put in some infrastructure or reduce the risk, reduce the insurance premiums, can you find a way to you know, take some of that savings to use in annual payments for infrastructure? I, I haven't seen a, a great example. I'd be curious if the Colonel or others have. Um, but I think it's absolutely critical. And, and this is an area where, where I may have a slight disagreement uh, with Richard on you know, the need not just to set a vision. Um, and, and I think the Greener Greater Building Plan is a good example in New York where it wasn't just setting a vision to say we want building owners to voluntarily benchmark their energy use. We want them then to hopefully do energy efficiency, but by having some requirements that induce people um, to take further action. And I think on, on many things when it comes uh, across the board for our infrastructure and for our operations, there needs to be that push and pull of, of things that you inform people about and hope they take action, things that you require them to do, and then finding those, those funding sources to help them even when it's required because the, the scale of change that's needed is too great for any single pair. Thank you. Well, we have time for one last question, uh, which one of our conference participants uh, so graciously created for us. And I think it's a good one and a good way to end. Uh, what two or three things did New York City do best after Sandy that other disaster-affected communities could emulate or learn from? So I'm going to start and just work my way down uh, with the Colonel. Well, I, I would start with the preparation, first of all. I, so I go with uh, preparing for Sandy, uh, and I give the city an A. Okay, compare the, uh, what happened with Katrina in terms of the loss of lives to what happened in this region. It's just not the city, but for, certainly the city. So you get an A for preparation. You get an A for looking at how to improve that. And I think the second thing is really turning around that plan and making that plan come alive quickly uh, seizing the momentum of the moment uh, so that we could really get started on, uh, on, uh, on a better future. Thank you, Adam. You know, I, I think the thing I was most excited by was that they didn't, it would have been very easy post-Sandy to have the post-Sandy plan of how we're going to deal with Sandy if it happens again. And, and they rightly said, we are not planning for the disaster that just happened. We're going to take a very hard look at all the hazards that face New York. And I, I think that is something that too often people plan for the last battle and don't think about the, the full horizon of risks they face. So I think that, uh, first and foremost, and I, I think the level of engagement, detail, and action that you've seen post-Sandy uh, in the SIR and in the implementation, uh, I don't know of another community that has been so broad, so sustained, and, and so action-oriented uh, than New York. Richard. I would agree with that, but I'd also give a kudo to the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. Rather than stick to its uh, uh, original plan where they would never close down a facility in order to fix it. They decided to bite the bullet and close the uh, uh, the art tunnel, the Mont Montague Street tunnel, for 14 months. I think it was done in 13 months uh, in order to get that fixed right. Okay, Matt. Uh, so, uh, ditto uh, to what's been said so far, and just to add a little bit to the mix, I would say. Uh, New York has been exceptional in keeping the people who are engaged after Sandy still engaged on all levels. So we're talking a lot here about uh, large organizations and government, uh, but also th so much happened after Sandy with uh, pop-up groups in a way, like Occupy Sandy. And many of these same people, maybe not working for the same organization, are still involved and still involved in community planning. So that sustained engagement has been exciting for me to see. I would, say, I would say the best thing is not only do they come up with a plan, but they put it in a book. <laughs> and you uh, just imagine, did, did the governor put it in a book? Did New Jersey's governor put it in a book? Uh, we have something that we can, uh, certainly not one that was as comprehensive and not one that we keep, can keep coming back to uh, year after year and see how we measure up against. Finally, Dan. Um, Definitely agree with Adam on uh, making sure that we didn't just fight the last battle. I think focusing on a broad range of things that may still be coming over the horizon is really important. Um, it was probably one of the innovations that came out of all the post-Sandy work. The other is um, not losing focus, you know, continuing to emphasize the investments we're making in resiliency, creating a brand new office to focus on it, I think is really important, very self-serving of me. Um, uh, but I think it's really, it, it highlights the administration's focus that we are continuing to make these investments, we're committed to this, and we're going to keep doing it. 
Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to us and engaging. I think this was just an extraordinary panel, and I want to thank the Water, Alli Water Alliance for in including all of us on this panel. Um, this doesn't happen everywhere. This kind of honest conversation about what we've done, what went wrong, what went right, and what we have to do in the future, this is fundamentally off the table in many cities and in many nations across the globe and the fact that we can come together and work as a community on these problems. A credit to you, Roland, and thank you so much.